So we're ready to roll. Okay. Hello yes. there, Barry. Okay. Hello. Hello, Barry. Okay. Hello, Barry. Shaper Amrik Kafuma de Olifas. You have spoken well according to what you have learned. Avol Chas Vishalom, the Afal Gav, the Rachel Havasakara Bahuzimna. Um, but God forbid, even though at the time Rachel was Akara, uh, unable to woman. Yaakov Chakim Hava. Or Ikara, the essence. So it's a play on words because um, it could also mean Ikar, which is the main thing or the essence. Jacob was wise. If he hadn't known that Leah was his wife, he wouldn't have her. To join with him in a single bond. He would have buried her outside the land. But Leah, he brought into the land. Whereas Rachel, he placed outside. So let's back this up a little bit. So everybody knows that that uh, Yaakov was tricked into marrying the older sister. He he was in love with Rachel, the younger sister. And, and he ended up with Leah. And then when he complained to, to his uh, father-in-law, to Laban, to Lavan, he said, okay, we'll give you her too. So he ended up marrying Rachel. Now, tragically, when they re-enter the land of Israel when he's fleeing from his own father-in-law from Laban, Rachel dies on the way, Kivrat Aretz Lava Ephrata, on the way into Ephrat. And he buries her there outside of that area. So first of all, there's a whole discussion. Why is she dying? Um, you know, the Torah says it was connected to after having given birth to Benjamin, but um, of course, the rabbis are kind of exploring rabbinically. There's like some wild explanations, such as you're not allowed to marry two sisters. But outside of the land of Israel, at that time, the avot didn't have the full kedusha, didn't have all the the laws, so to speak, didn't fully apply. Um, but once they went into the land of Israel, they began to apply or, or simply that Jacob made. He was hasty with his words. He, he, when Levin was looking for his idol, he, he said, whoever is stole your idol, he put a curse on them. So he didn't know it was rough. I mean, there's a lot of different explanations. So that's one thing is like, what is going on why does Rachel die? And not just that she dies, why isn't she brought in to be buried? If it's his favorite wife, why isn't she prearranged to be buried? I know even with COVID right now, everybody's like, you know, if, if I die, I want to still be buried in Israel. Okay. So why why did she not make it into the Machpelah, the 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 um, burial place of the patriarchs and matriarchs, and why did Leah? Okay, so and then it explores also the dynamics in general of who is Rachel and who is Leah spiritually. Let's take a look at note 60, Zev. 66. 66. <clears throat> Rabbi uh, Elazar, my son. The beginning of this passage is missing, so it is unclear exactly what Rabbi Elazar has said, prompting this response from his father, Rabbi Shema. The cave refers to the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham originally purchased, uh, which Abraham originally purchased as a burial site for Sarah. 
and in which the matri all the matriarchs except for Rachel <coughs> the matriarchs were eventually buried. The description of Rachel as Ikara, the essence, is a play on Akara, barren, her former condition. Since she was essential, symbolizing Shrina, Jacob should have buried her in the cave of Machpelah rather than on the way from Beth uh, Bethel to uh, Bethlehem, where she died while giving birth to Benjamin. However, Jacob's first wife, Leah, symbolizes the concealed realm, Bina, so it was fitting that she be buried within a cave, whereas Rachel was buried outside, corresponding to the more revealed realm, Shrina. Jacob, symbolizing Tiferes, was buried alongside, Shrina, uh, 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 alongside Leah in a single bond. Actually, Rachel was not buried outside the land, but rather within its boundaries, as stated by Jacob. As for me, I was returning from Padan. Rachel died to my sorrow in the land of Canaan on the way, with still a stretch of land to reach Ephrat. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, which is Bethlehem. However, on the clause, and I, have and I buried her there, Rashi writes, I did not even bring her to Bethlehem, uh, so as to bring her into the land. The Zohar is likely re relying on the literal sense of the inter this interpretation. And then on Rashi's comment, you can see a number of places and also on the question of why Rachel was not buried in, in Machpelah. Okay, great. That's a great note, really fills in a lot. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, this is a, a kind of a a little bit of a, a dating or women, women's friendship and dating metaphor to help us understand this. Um, you ever see like two women that go out, they go to, I mean, it, it's hard to talk about Rachel and Leah like this, but they go to a bar and one is very beautiful and one isn't. And, um, they're both marriageable age, kind of, you know, looking for the right guy. And men come over to them. They, they, they're mostly coming over because there's a, they want to attract, they, they want to talk to a very attractive woman. But you, know, you can't be rude. You can't just talk to the attractive women, woman without first uh, talking to her friend or, and, and as the conversation goes, um, people have to engage the two of them. Beautiful women are for unimaginative men. What's that? <laughs> yeah. I think I just shot myself twice on, <laughs> on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm just thick, I don't understand it, but uh, explain, explain. <laughs> No, never mind. So, so if you were like a dating strategist or coach, you'd be like, why, why, why does, why is it, is the woman just need a friend for protection? What is the, what does the less attractive woman get out of right away being compared to a beautiful woman? And, and the people are really going to just kind of talk to her, but they're not interested in her, right? So the truth is that it could be that on her own, the unattractive woman is not going to get male attention um, because she's not attractive, so she's going to get less attention. So she has a strategy, a dating strategy, which is by being together with a beautiful woman, uh. she'll... He's surrounded by men, and maybe one of those men will find her interesting. You're on such thin ice at the moment, right? Now. Well, what does it have to do with Rachel and Leah? <laughs> in my understanding of the Zohar, and here in other areas, the two women in the bar, on some level, again, very subtly, you have to be very careful here, are Rachel and Leah. Rachel is the beautiful woman, and Leah is her less attractive sister. The truth is, is that without Rachel, 
Leia would never have ended up with Yaakov. But guess what? Sometimes, as many times in life, the right woman or the brighter woman or the more interesting woman is not the more attractive woman. It could be. There's no reason why an attractive woman can't be intelligent and, and, and kind and caring. They absolutely can. But just as often, a, a physically unattractive woman, I don't, I, I, it hurts me to say physically unattractive, but less attractive, let's just say, could in fact be the deeper of the two. So this, that's exactly what happened to Jacob. It turns out on some level, on some bechina, that Leah is the pnimiyut. She rela- she's even above Jacob, spiritually speaking. She's, she's actually higher than Jacob. Jacob didn't get her because he wasn't on her level. The only reason why he associated with her, was interested in her, is out of respect for her sister. That's how they got together in the first place, because he was tricked. But as he got to know her, something happened. He realized who Leah was. So that's what the Zohar is saying. And here in many other places, that, the, that Rachel is the revealed, which is usually Machut or Zerampin, and Leah is the concealed, is the Bina, uh, is the Mochen. The, the, the part of the mental facilities that's not yet revealed, so to speak. Okay. So that's the introduction, really, to understanding a little bit of both the Bechina of Rachel and Leah and why it had to come out in this weird way. Okay. You following me? I would, I would hope that a dating story would, 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 help us relate to this but, it is, but still no <laughs> anyone everyone ran everyone ran off to check their dating apps to see if your theory is right it's my theory actually they're gone it's funny because i came up with this theory not to help understand the dating world but to really understand this issue with rachel and leah how how it he's attracted to rachel because he doesn't pay any attention to the sister, but it turns out that really Leia is the deep one. Okay, let's continue on uh, page 77. I mean, really, I think what you're saying is that God, right, plants this wrong strategy in the mind of the one, right? Because really it's a bad strategy because you're, the man is going to compare the less, you know, the, the lesser one to the better one and say, I'm not interested. But somehow by that person still connecting themselves to the better one, which might not be the best strategy for her, it turns out that actually what has to happen ends up happening. Yes. In other words, it doesn't, it, it would never have happened at all if not for this you know, situation. Um, and, and even when it does happen, it happens in this really strange way, this 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 trickery. Um, but eventually it happens. And, and, and that's for a spiritual reason, as the czar here and in many other places indicates. Okay. okay. When Jacob died... He was buried within, in the cave, in a single bond. Just like all the other patriarchs. And also Adam. First Eve died, Chava, and she was buried there. And Adam died there. And Adam there knew about that place, that that would be the fitting place for her to be buried. When he was, uh, when he died, he was buried there with a single bond. And a single bond means that he's bond not just to, you know, the, 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 the term when somebody dies, let them, their soul be bound, bound to the bond of life, but also to the Bechina, 
of his wife. Okay, to Chava. Is this like a very interesting, like, like so, so man, woman is for man. So then man, for example, when looking for his mate is, has, has to be sort of uh, uh, looking for his missing uh, complement, his missing part. So in other words, for, for where, like the language here of like what the right place is, man is always looking for the right place for him and the right place is where the woman that is from him is. And so interestingly, it sounds like weirdly, how should a man know where he's supposed to be buried? Hmm, well, look where, where the right place for you is. Like this place is more than just like physical, it's like the spiritual place. And it turns out actually man wouldn't find the place necessarily looking on its own for his own place. He needs to find the woman's place, which is where he's supposed to be. And the woman knows her place maybe because of like a Bina Yusera or something like that. Is that maybe what's going on here? It's just um, weird that. At least in this case, it's like, you know, knowing your Bechina, knowing who you're shy to, meaning when, when, when a person is looking for a wife, what they're looking for is somebody who complements them spiritually in terms of who the Shorsh or the Neshama. That's why a lot of times people who are very close move away because one or both of them become realigned into a different type of kind of sephirotic um, personality. And, and, and they're no longer compatible. They moved away from each other in the spherot level. And sometimes in death, like in this case of Adam and Chava, they reunite. I'm not saying that they were divorced, although according to the Medrash and the Zohar, Adam and Chava both had their kind of periods, years of separation. Um, but yeah, it, it is this very beautiful like kind of coming together in death in, in the Bechino. Uh -huh. But are we saying that the the actual place of death is is supposed to is not accidental, but it's actually Correct. intentional? Correct. At least in, as far as as a place like the Mar Samachpela is concerned, that 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 cave, which represent the cave, is a metaphor for the hidden, and the and the Machpela, the doubles, the, the the doublet, so to speak, is also a metaphor for pairs that belong together not just physically in this world but also spiritually in the next world which by the way is a good question we talked about this before you know when people get married are they getting married um for this lifetime or a year or 10 years of this lifetime or are they getting married for the next lifetime or the or the light the afterlife so to speak and the answer is we don't know because we're not like soul readers to know that this couple is actually going to be together in another lifetime. That's the type of stuff we were, we already learned about that and we still know nothing about it, but we were learning about the idea of, of the reincarnated souls and how that plays into soulmates and things like that. Okay. So this is a, you know, the czar is, is, should be to some degree understood as an integrated whole. So every part kind of illuminates the other part. So. Okay, let's continue. Mesa Sarah is Kabras Taman Vachava Hamas. When Sarah died, she was buried there, and, and, and Eve saw her and was delighted. And she rose to welcome her. Wow. So there's like, so you're right, David. It seems at least so far the women, I'm not David, I mean, and not that David isn't right, but Ben was the <laughs> one that the point, that it seems like the women are the ones who die first, and then by them being buried there, the men then discover where it is that they belong, like what the right level, so to speak, that they're in. But interestingly enough, the two women connect in death. Right. So, so that's not in our text, but it's very nice, which is the um, the measurement. Uh, say it, read it again. I'll say I didn't finish the sentence. I realized what we said. Okay, she ura the chava lagabe sora. She ura the shrein amen velo yatir. The measurement of of uh, Eve or chava compared to to Sarah was two amot and no and no more. 
This is the distance or the difference in size? Um, read, why don't you read what you have the Maltik Midvash on you? What, what do you no, use? I'm just using the Safari. You know, wait a second. Let me see if I can grab something here. Uh, Zab, you want to read the note in the meantime? Yeah, we were at uh, note sixty-seven, and then I uh, guess are we are we going to be sticking with volume nine for a while? Well, I don't know. This is going to be our last session uh, for a while, so we're going to have next week off because of Tish above. Mm -hmm. And I think the rabbi wanted to take a break for a few weeks. Yeah, I think it's it's coming that uh, that I think we're just going to resume. I think August. I don't want to. I, I don't want to say that we won't meet at all in August, but I'd like to say that if we do meet at all in August, it'll be very much the exception, not the rule, because I don't know that I'm going on vacation, but I have to pretend that I am. You know what I mean? <laughs> for my own sanity. If, even if it's a staycation, so I need to do something different. I don't know what it is. And all I could think of is Wednesday night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know it sounds terrible. I can't believe that you consider this is work. It's not work, but I need to create some, like, you, you know how, like, there's no difference day and night anymore and your work and your house. I have to do something in my head to end this year already you know like it's like end it and begin again that's what i mean like i usually go away so it's a physical thing i i, I travel in, in, in august or whatever it is or july august and that very much like helps me reset i don't know how i'm going to do it this year to be honest with you but i keep preaching this thing like pretend things are normal except that they're not so like if you would if you would go away let's say for two weeks so tell your boss that you're you're gonna be gone you know like tell the show that you're that you're you're gone and you're really just hiding in your apartment or something i, I you know what i mean so yeah I, th I think i need to do that just for my own sanity for the to help with a reset I, i'm doing fine i'm not complaining i'm just saying i it's not so much sanity as much as like trying to have a seder you know like an order which is by the way good for the economy also because i was talking to people in real estate i know david you're in, in real estate about office space because a lot of people are saying who's going to need office space everybody can uh, you know seems to be working at home but we're going to need office space because it doesn't really work in the long term just to work at home because for the same reason you need to have della you need like you need a separate element for your workspace and your it's not fair for your spouse or your kids that you're just you know there's no day there's no night there's no private there's no public what do you think david am i on to something no, no well i think you're you're partly right rabbi i think that the, the, that is a big d debate going at the moment is is not that that office space isn't needed but it's just to do with the amount of office space that's going to be needed so that there may be situations where people who ordinarily would have come into the city five days a week will now come into the city three days a week or two days a week and work closer to home. Uh, and, and, and so that um, there's, you know, nobody knows what the hell is really happening. But, I, but th I this totally is agree with you. Yeah, I totally think. I, I agree that there's going to be a reshuffle. There's going to be more, you know, more remote working. Right. But at some point, it's not going to, I don't think the majority of people are just going to be like, we will never come into an office and we don't need to, and then we're, we're, we're productive at home. I think there's going to be um, a pushback against that, rightfully so. It's not fair for families uh, who, who need to have separation from each other, for lack of a better word. Uh, I don't know how we got into this, but uh, yeah, but the, that's and back to said you said you need I started reset. it. I know, I know. Because this is the same thing. It's a, it's a reset it's for a real reset. estate. Yeah. It's like resetting a ring. You know, if you have a new shaped stone, you just need to reset it. They're still. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. There's this company we work, which, um, you know, was uh, showing signs of teetering on the edge um, when we were going into this. And how are they doing now? Well, now on, on a conventional wisdom basis, that they, I mean, they're in terrible shape, right? But on a convention, my daughter-in-law works there. 
And um, um, but the, on a conventional wisdom basis, is that the type of office space people are going to like is by going ex exactly that, where you don't have to make long term commitments, mm -hmm. like dating, Rabbi. Yeah. Okay. Which is which is also teetering on the edge. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff on the edge right now. <laughs> okay, the only consistent thing we have now is Zohar. So I'm not yeah. making too bad if I if I take a few weeks off. But uh, um, where's Ted? I don't know. This Ted. I, I feel bad. I hope Ted didn't come in and then couldn't get in. Zev, you want to tell him? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. There was I, one person who. Uh, said that he couldn't get in. He didn't think. Was that? Well, no one could get in because I, I, yeah. I couldn't leave. That must have been me on the tap. But um, cl clearly, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, did you read the note sixty seven? You did. No, no, I didn't read it yet. Oh, read it. Read it. Uh, when Jacob died, he was buried in the cave of Machpelah alongside Leah in a single bond, just as Abraham was buried alongside Sarah and Isaac alongside Rebecca. Rabbinic uh, tradition adds that Abraham and Eve were also buried there. Based on this tradition, the Zohar teaches that the cave of Machpelah leads to the Garden of Eden, which may explain why it's discussed here in Rav Masifta. Because they went through a cave to get to the garden. Okay. Yeah, I don't have the right Zohar here. Oh, look at that. Okay, let's continue. When Abraham died, he was buried with her in a single bond. When died, she was buried there. And, and Sarah rose in, uh, to welcome her. Notice there's no welcome committee for the men. Only the women get welcomed by the last woman to have died before her. Hmm. But doesn't in the Midrash... Uh, Abraham is welcomed by Adam. You're right. So this is a very good point. Augustine's making a good point that this this is not the only medrash on on, on this on this case. But here it, we're talking about the women. So for whatever reason, it's either leaving out the men. Either it's a it's a different medrash. It is a different medrash. So uh, the Zohar is like a medrash here. Okay. So let's continue with this. It's great how mother-in-laws and daughter-in-laws really love each other in, in death. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when Isaac died, he was buried with her in a single bond. By the way, it doesn't say by Abraham and Sarah the single bond. Oh, it does. I'm sorry. My mistake. I didn't look this over. It does. Um, um, I'm making trouble here. I shouldn't be making trouble. Okay. <laughs> when Isaac died, he was buried with her in a single bond. When Leah died, she was buried there. And Rebecca saw and rose to welcome her. Continue. When Yaakov died, he was buried there in a single bond. All of the male has one in a single bond. Note 68, very short. When Abraham died, he was buried alongside Sarah. Then eventually Isaac was buried alongside Rebecca and Jacob alongside Leah. Okay, that's the cliff notes. Continue, Ben. As for their arrangements, how did they lie? Women alongside women, men alongside men. Apparently there was a pretty strict uh, separation of the sexes. Who knew, even in death. Adam first, Eve next to him. So Sarah alongside Eve, Abraham next. Yitzchak Samachlav Raham to Sarah. So it's not really men and women separated. It's just that it's just that that there's you're somehow only next to your wife or uh, your son. You know. So, so it's it's Adam and Eve, Sarah and Abraham, Isaac and Rebecca. Well, is it that okay? If if one is aligning these people, that Sarah is next to Rebecca, Isaac is on the other side. 
Abraham is next yeah. to yeah. yeah 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 Isaac is next to Rebecca but it's just that he's not next to somebody else's wife Right. But is right. it the way I'm seeing it? Is it's like it's yeah. not so much of a linear parallel. In other words, uh, like let's say feet to feet, opposite, you know, man to woman. It's that it started with Adam, and then kind of like uh, it's hard to right. So the the next Chava was next to him, but not aligned, you know, head to to feet, but sort of moved forward so only a part of it overlapped and then the next one was abraham right next to adam and that uh, so it's like almost like zigzagging not zig you know what i mean like uh, a pattern of of in and out yeah, like partial partial overlap talks about how they were buried jerusalem Talmud, and other places so it's not you know there, there's you could research look up some of the footnotes and and, and see how this this runs down uh, even in this text itself, it's it's kind of if you if you would be overly didactic, it seems to contradict. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but it is this is the text. Rebecca next to Isaac, Leah next to Rebecca, Jacob next to Leah. So Adam on this side and Jacob on the other. In other words. Um, you know, Adam starts, it, it's bookended by Adam on one side and Jacob on the other. One, the beginning, and the other, the end. Okay. Uh, you want to read that in Aramaic? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I read some of it. I'll go. Adam Bereisha Chava Okay, great. Um, note 69. Uh, as for their arrangement, from the right side of the cave to the left, if oriented as one enters the cave, the four couples were buried in the following order. Adam and Eve, Sarah and Abraham, Isaac and Rebecca, Leah and Jacob. According to this arrangement, women lay alongside women, although the description men alongside men only applies to Abraham and Isaac, not to Abraham and Jacob. On the arrangement of the graves in the cave of Machpelah, See uh, Jerusalem, Talmud, Tinus, and elsewhere. Okay, great. 78. In the book of King Solomon, it is fitting. And so it is. Adam and Eve first. Oh, Adam and Eve first. Okay, so this is its own order from this, this other book. Uh, Adam and Eve first, Abraham and Sarah next to them. Yes, Isaac, directly across in a straight line, Jacob and Leah in the middle. There are women alongside women, men alongside men. Adam and Eve, Sarah and Abraham, Jacob, Leah, and Leah, Rebecca, and Isaac, Adam on this side, and Isaac on that side. So in this, in this case, Isaac is the bookend of the other side, with Jacob in the middle. For Isaac, go on. Yitzhak l'gabe avua lav orach alma, vim kolda Yaakov etzchavotzi. To be alongside his father is not customary. Nevertheless, Jacob must be in the middle. Let's uh, read the note on that, uh, Zev. Even though that makes Jacob next to his father. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah, we'll see why. In the the book of King Solomon, according to this ancient source, the four couples were buried as follows from the right side of the cave to the left. Adam and Eve, Sarah and Abraham, Jacob and Leah, Rebecca and Isaac. This arrangement is more fitting because it is not customary for the son Isaac to be buried alongside his father. Abraham is in the previous arrangement. One might object that still the grandson Jacob is buried next to his grandfather Abraham. However, this problem is overridden by the fact that Jacob symbolizing Tiferes should be in the middle, with Abraham symbolizing Chesed towards the right, and Isaac symbolizing Gvura on the left. On Jacob's corpse being flanked by Abraham and Isaac, see elsewhere in the Zohar. On the phrase men alongside men, see the preceding note. The Book of Solomon is one of the many volumes housed in the real or imaginary library of the authors of the Zohar. For other references to this book, see uh, elsewhere in the Zohar. 
Nachmanides re several times refers to in quotes from an Aramaic version of the apocryphal wisdom of Solomon. Okay, um, great. Yeah. Um, just a little bit about grandparents and grandchildren. So a lot of times, not all the time, it's, a simple, it's, a, it's, a, it's a oversimplified here. Look, Abraham and Isaac have a complicated relationship in terms of their sefirot. We're not even going to talk about the, the stories in the Chumash about things like that, the Akedah, which obviously, if you were a psychologist, you it, it's a very troubling story. I'm not a psychologist, and I don't read it at all in, in its literal sense. I think it's a meaningless story in its more literal sense, just like many other things in the Bible that you read literally are, are me not meaningless. They're just, they're just not really the way I understand it, the way the teachers that I read to help me understand Chumash, understand it. But I'm not going to get sidetracked by, by the details of the story. But let's just talk about parents and children versus parents and grandparents. What you often have is a parent and a grandparent, a parent and a child are often too close to each other and really oppose one another uh, dialectically. Meaning in the case of Abraham and, and, and Yitzchak, Abraham is chesed. And Yitzhak is Gvura. That's it's it, it doesn't go together. Uh, Tiferes, which is Yaakov, can go either with Chesed or Gvura. That's the it's like if you're all if you're like who who are the people who are not getting along right now, right? The people who are either law and order, hundred percent. There's no room for any. There's no exceptions, um, and there's no and we're not gonna we're not going to say a particular life matters because that just means that that's not the law. The law is every, every life is equal. Um, so, uh, so you've got the law. That would be like Isaac theory, like the Bechina of Din. And then if you had somebody saying, no, 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 this is all, we have to, like, we're not judging anyone. If people think that they're not being treated correctly and they want to protest, we're going to let them protest. If there's going to be some riots, that the, it's a lot of pent up frustration. We have to understand where they're coming from before we really judge critically. And also we can't, we can't equip, we have to understand all of the bad things that are happening because we're, we're, we love, love is paramount. So you get two people like that in a the room, they're not gonna agree with one another. You get somebody who has compassion the compassion, which is what, what Isaac, which Jacob represents. So they could have compassion for somebody who's into forgiveness and love, or it doesn't even, it was not judgmental. And they can also relate to somebody who has a lot of judgment because they agree that there should be rules and regulations, but they also believe in the power of creating a, a second chance for somebody. Uh, through through Rachman, through mercy and the power of tshuva. So, but that could be in any relationship between a parent and a grandparent. Uh, is that you've got this this the parent child relationship is often too close and too much in conflict. So it's almost like the Zohar is is giving. You know that's the beauty of the Zohar. It's kind of like putting it out there. The Torah says, honor your father and your mother. And the Zohar is saying, of course you should honor your father and your mother. But sometimes your grandparent and you can be closer than you and your parent. And that's okay, because it's, look at Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Okay, so that's just my little note for this, how to understand this. Okay. Regarding all these couples, as they were buried, so they're going to get up again. They're going to rise, and so they will be. Leah will delight with Mashiach, the son of David, because after all, it's her descendant. She's the mother of Yehuda, and David is from the tribe of, of Yehuda. Did not take me not ago. Rachel Rachel will delight with the the Mashiach, the son of Joseph. 
this according to the, the our understanding, there's the Mashiach ben David and the Mashiach ben Yosef. Outside of Jerusalem, all in their places. Elaine Hacha be Elaine Hacha. Some here, some in, in, in there. Um, go ahead, note 71. As they were buried. In the same arrangement, they will be resurrected in the Messianic era. Leah, symbolizing the concealed realm, Bina, will rejoice with the Messiah, son of David, within Jerusalem. David was descended from Leah's son, Judah. Rachel, symbolizing the more revealed realm, Shrina, will rejoice with Messiah, son of Joseph, outside of Jerusalem. Joseph was Rachel's son. According to rabbinic tradition, the secondary uh, messianic the, the figure, Messiah, son of Joseph, will precede Messiah, son of David, and he will die heroically in battle with the enemies of God and Israel before the ultimate triumph of the Messiah, son of David. Okay, great. Page 79. All of pearls and precious stones. Now we're going to get up back to, we're, we're finished with that thought. Um, and now we're going to get back, which is also, it seems like there's some parts of the following text that's missing, but it, we're going to get back into the description of the <coughs> heavenliness of these yeshivot. Go on. Amongst all those towers. Ah, we lost Ben. Okay. Anybody else have access to the Zohar? In, I could pull it up in Safari. Yeah. Let's see okay. here. I got it. I got it. Okay. One, two, three, four. Oh, ben is back. Oh. Sorry, I got a knock. Lost has been found. Okay, Ben, you ready? Yeah. All of pearls and precious stones. The Inun Margalon, the Evan Tavakulu. Go on. Amongst all these towers, there is one tower in the middle. Ben Kulu Migdalan Ischad Migdal, the Evan Tava Bemsa Isa, the Dasalak Larum Rakia, below Saze Hashta. This one rises to the height of heaven and is not visible now until the time. Go on. Arahuz and the Yiskalev. Till the time that it be revealed. Rav Masif to Chamalev, the Russian Bela Ela Hikra. The head of the academy saw it and engraved on it above was this Pasu. Migdal O Shem Hashem Bo Yeret Tzadik Benizgov. All right. The name of God is a tower of strength. The, go on. Ufaris Rav Masifta Krada Migdal O's Duck Nasus. The righteous man runs into it and is secure. The head of the academy explained this this pasuk, this verse. The name of God is Assembly of Israel, 164b. The righteous one, Yarutz, runs into it. Ruute, the righteous one is always for it. Therefore, it is secure the tower so it will never fail, fall as it did. Here, go ahead and read that in Aramaic. Okay. Uh, go ahead and read 72 and 73, Zav. 72, uh, all, of, all of pearls and precious stones. The beginning of this passage is missing both in the manuscripts and printed editions. Two spiritual messengers are describing to Rabbi Shimon the heavenly temple and the future coming of the Messiah. On the two messengers, see below at note 134. In this description, the Garden of Eden is assimilated to the restored temple in Jerusalem or the idealized temple in heavenly Jerusalem. <clears throat> this accords with the Midrashic tradition that the gate of the Garden of Eden is adjacent to Mount Moriah. And then note 73, among all those towers, the central tower in the heavenly temple is engraved with a verse from Proverbs explained here by the head of the Heavenly Academy. 
Shrina, known as the Assembly of Israel, is pictured as the name of Havaya, revealing his presence to the world. She is also a tower of strength. Yesod, known as Righteous One, uh, Yesod, known as Righteous One, constantly desires to unite with Shrina to run into this tower. Obviously, according to the simple sense of the verse, it is the righteous one who is secure, but the head of the academy indicates that the tower symbolizing Shrina is secure, meaning that she will not fall again as she did, metaphorically, when the temple was destroyed. See Brachas, fallen not to rise again as virgin Israel. Uh, she has fallen and not, uh, will not fall again. Okay, keep going. The verse in Proverbs reads, the name of Havaya is a tower of strength. The righteous one, Bo Yarutz, runs into it, or runs in it. Then is God and is secure, and literally, and is elevated. Here, the head of the academy associates with Yarutz, r runs with Ratzon, desire, by mentioning the Aramaic word, uh, Rute, yeah. R mm -hmm. his desire on the tower see below note 80 on the verse in Proverbs and Shrina is a tower of strength see elsewhere in the Zohar okay great thank you Zev can I ask a question sure okay about the connection between Kivu Machbela uh, being adjacent or somehow connected with uh, Mount Moriah yeah That was the question. Can I pose it as a question? So they're connected? You know what? If that's what it says, I, I, I mean, you, you're asking a, a, a geographic question or is it yeah, hard? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I guess it's a geographic. Does one lead into the other? You know, there's a relationship between them. Geographically, I don't quite understand it. It has a lot to do with it has something to do with that with 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 King David, you know, who right because he started out in Hebron and then he went to Jerusalem. There's some in that context. The commentaries talk a lot about the the relationship between that area and Jerusalem. You know, I know there's stuff on it. I don't. It's not on the tip of my head. No. Yeah. No. I mean, it, it's pretty, uh, you know, interesting. I think, you know, that somehow uh, the temple itself is on the site of the gate to the Garden of Eden. Yeah. I mean, we 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 like to connect holy sites to one another. There's no question about it. Historically, to events that happen there or to other holy sites, even if they're not geographically in exactly the same place. We, you know, the Medrash goes out of its way to connect, to, to bend space <laughs> if necessary, and says it even, you know, like, mm -hmm. it, it knows that it's bending space. It's, or Einstein knew how to, you know, bend, uh, I don't know if he's, you know, bend the fabric of the of, of, of the universe in which light is traveling in or whatever it is, the rabbis were busy bending space, you know, and putting different spirit places together with Yaakov is the, you know, when Yaakov lies down, so to speak, and yeah. all of the Medrash on so, that into this kind of, now, yeah, in other places. So I, I have to excuse myself, but, um, I look forward to resuming after we take a break. Yeah, we'll take a break. I mean, I, I'm not saying maybe we will meet um, in August once, maybe twice, but I, but but definitely not more. I'm not I'm not trying to keep it going in August. So just I'll, I'll tell Zeb. I'll look at the calendar. I know we can't meet next week because it's uh, Tishubov, and maybe we'll meet one more time after that. You know. Okay. Sounds good. I'll be in touch with everyone. Okay. Be well. You too, Abby. You too, Abby. Hasta la vista. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Zev. Yeah, I feel bad. Like, I think we should, like, do 
this one more time when we know it's going to be the last time. And by that time, it'll only be a few weeks till we start again. So it won't be like a big So day. this thing showed up uh, on Facebook saying, the month of Av, the power to create or destroy is dependent on communication. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rabbi Chris Bidai. Rabbi, Rabbi Chris Bidai, Hamid Liba. Desired by the heart. Parash Haikra at Lois Dalek of Shapir. Explain this verse before he passed away, explaining it really nicely. Migdal O's, Dateva Vesevatar, the Ihu O's. The tower of strength, the teva, right? The teva is like the ark or the the pulpit and the Torah scroll, which is strength. To be placed on it and taken out of the hechel, taken out of the ark. Image of the inner Hechel from which the Torah comes out of. That tower is the name of God. In his image, and it must have six steps. Okay, um, Reb Yassi. Yes. Which note do you want? 74? Uh, Rav Nathali, you want note 74? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, Rabbi Kruspada, his illness and his heavenly vision are described in Zohar Hadash. Here, a Rabbi Kruspada offers a, a related interpretation of the verse in Proverbs. The tower still symbolizes Shekhinah, who is also the name of Yodhei Bavhe. He adds that the tower is the teva, pulpit, or elevated reading desk, on which is placed the Torah scroll, which is pictured as strength. Torah symbolizes Tiferet, who is placed on Shehina. The earthly Hechal corresponds to the inner Hechal, which uh, here may signify the abode of the Messiah, as in uh, Mosadilion, question mark, Seder, Gun, Eden, Eden. Alternately, the inner Hechal refers to Bina, from whom emerges Tiferet, symbolized by Torah. The tower symbolizes Shekhinah, as the image of Tiferet, known as uh, Habaya. And uh, its six steps represent six aspects of Shekhinah, or her six camps of angels. In classic rabbinic literature, uh, the term uh, teva means ark or chest, but here refers to pulpit or elevated reading desk. The pulpit is commonly known as a, be as a, a bima, uh, derived from the Greek um, bema, raised platform, which itself may have derived from the Phoenician cognate of the Hebrew uh, bama, high place, cult site. In medieval Spain, the pulpit was a wooden uh, platform placed high above the ground and columns. Um, as here in the Zohar, it is called uh, Migdal, a tower. In fact, already in uh, Nehemiah 8.4, uh, the term Migdal signifies a wooden platform from which the Torah was read publicly. The term Hechal means temple, sanctuary, palace, chamber, and in medieval Sephardic usage, also Ark, which was sometimes a special small room attached to the synagogue. And it has a bunch of references. Um, the concluding sentence refers to six uh, uh, steps heading to the pulpit, which correspond to the six steps leading to Solomon's throne, which symbolizes Shehina. Then goes on. One uh, on Torah's strength. It does a bunch of references. That's just about it. Okay, that's a fascinating so, stuff. Right, more than we bargained for in that note. I right, think. right. So is that the continued the idea of six steps? Yeah, well, the six steps are, what are they, the six uh, spherot? 
Yeah, but is that continued in, in synagogue uh, uh, architecture? Today, it, it, I don't think so. But um, yeah, besides for the six steps, you have all of these kind of uh, double meanings of these words, right? Yeah. That some of them are kind of scary. Bima, bama, uh oh, that's a problem. I didn't want, I don't want to know that actually. There's some of the stuff in this note that's be better not read, not known, you know? Well, it, it's kind of a neat kind of connection. Because I've always been very interested in about the, the high places and how yeah. the high places were so important, but they're not. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't it like, you know, Kadush, you know, holy and, and impure, like the double entendre? Without the double entendre, the, the impure or the non good part of it wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Like the Bama would be nothing if there wouldn't be maybe Bima. Mm. Unconvincing <laughs> yeah. and persuasive. Yeah, yeah, and and these things have been evolving. The synagogue interior and and the sacred kind of um, what do, what do you call furniture? So it's a fancy. Give me a fancy word for furniture. For sacred furniture, is there a better word than that? There's got to be ritual, ritual this, interior design. Yeah, ritual design. You know, they, 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 it's it's a fascinating area because even today synagogues are moving away from things they may have done in Europe uh, and and so on. So no, like this is interesting, um, and. Uh as the bizarre itself says, this is like a really good teaching. You know, it's all good, but no, this is this is really good. This Rabbi Crespedai's teaching about the, the Teva and the Heichal and the the inner Heichal, so on. So is is Rabbi uh, Crespedai, uh, you know, if only to the Zohar, or does he exist somewhere else? Um, I think he exists somewhere else. Just that in the Zohar, he's more well known. Yeah. <laughs> um, but even recently, like the style and the culture has changed a lot. Like I was in Venice in the whatever they call the Jewish uh, section there, I guess the yeah. ghetto, or yeah. and they do a, a their bunch of synagogues, old synagogues. And so my tour guide was, you know, they're like figures of lions or murals or whatever, and he was well. He was trying to explain how even though this is idolatry and inappropriate and prohibited in the synagogue, you know, this was what I, what, I don't remember his explanation because it's years ago. And I just remember thinking like, and I asked him, at, you know, it, it turned out he wasn't even a Jewish person. So he didn't necessarily have analogs of synagogues, but like years ago, synagogues like on the parochia by the art, you know, would always have lions and all that kind of stuff. And it was clearly part of the European, like he had a very non zoharinic approach to like the ritual art in a synagogue. And at some point that clearly changed. And today it's, it's really out of style again, but it isn't, I don't think anyone thinks, I mean, maybe there are opinions like that, but I don't think it's for, for sure like the Hasidic kind of like Stiebel approach, right? I don't think anyone thought yeah, lions yeah. are the reason why things change are not necessarily like, oh, this group likes the Zohar and their architecture reflects that. And this other group likes the Shulchan Aruch and the other group likes the Yerushalmi. But it's more like, I don't know, like the suburban sprawl. <laughs> yeah. Much of an explanation sometimes. Uh, there, there, there's often uh, I thought uh, it's the president's wife who gets to interior decorate the yeah, it's often it's often very simple decisions that have to do with with very pragmatic things of, of, of why shuls start to be built a certain way where they they take something in or out like so for example like you'll see in the Shulchan Aruch it says the chazan has to, to, to has to be davening lower than everyone else like there's this idea, and, and now the bima, which is where the Torah was read, was higher, but the chazan was lower, and now it's like 
some oh. schools like ours don't have to don't have a separate um Bima and a and a shtender for the chaz in, in a lower place. They just all combine. I, I don't want to read too much into that because it's just it's it's just the way they built the shul for spatial reasons. You know, I don't want to I don't overanalyze things that 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 might have been done wrong. You know, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But that's what we did, and that's okay. Yeah, but there is that big divide between the Ashkenazic and Sephardic arrangement of a of a sanctuary that, you know, uh, like for instance, in Reformed Judaism, and most of in conservative Judaism, it, it's basically, there's this raised area where all that stuff is going on and the audience gets to watch it. It's quite different if, if it's, if there's the Sephardic concept of it being in the center. You mean you mean the uh, like the, the way the Spartac synagogues have like a slope on either side, going? Well, it's more it, it's more like the whatever is the raised area That's is in the midst of the people. The people are can be along the side, but it's all going on in the center facing the ark. Versus often, unfortunately, where it's turned around. The, the, that, yeah. that was like sort of like a totally different right is it participatory or performance right is the is it like one comprehensive yeah you know, I mean, are you facing the people are you facing are you facing the uh the the Aron, you know but even in the orthodox places where you face the Aron, there was this concept and they still have it in certain synagogues where it's the mizrahman the esteemed people not just the rabbi the big the big shots, they sit facing the people, you know? Uh, a lot of big synagogues still have the rabbi and the president on chairs on top of these, ele the elevated platform, the so-called yeah. six steps that we just read about. Right. The people, But that's actually based on a practice where you, you gave enough money, you got to sit up there, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> or sit facing the people. So yeah, there's interesting stuff. We have to... I, 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 we have to wrap it up for tonight. I guess we'll try to meet one more time before this kind of so-called break or just, yeah, I, I, I like the idea that we have some, you know, we, we end and then we start again in Elul, which by the way, Elul is, is not even in September. I think it starts towards the end of August even. But um, so maybe we'll, Zev will, I'll coordinate with Zev when we meet next. Obviously not next week, it's Tisha B'Av um, next, next Wednesday night. So we'll have to skip that. But God willing, probably next Wednesday, uh, two Wednesdays from now, God willing. I'm gonna are you having services on uh, Tisha B'Av? We are with the limited seating, but yes, we are. Yeah.